State of Florida v. Aaron Lee Robinson, case number 14CF 11818A. We, the jury, as to count one of the indictment, find as follows. The defendant is guilty of first degree felony murder as charged. We, the jury, as to count two of the indictment, find as follows. The defendant is guilty of burglary as charged. During the commission of the crime, did Aaron Robinson commit a battery against Raul Ortiz? Yes. Was the structure entered a dwelling? Yes. We, the jury, as to count three of the indictment, find as follows. The defendant is not guilty. So say we all dated this 22nd day of October 2020. Now, no case is easy, but some cases are, are relatively simple. And it was simple. His girlfriend said something about hap happened at the Circle K. He got angry, got in the truck, a whole bunch of them, and they drove to his house. Why were they going there? To exchange greeting cards? Uh, no. He went over there to beat the guy up. And that's what he did. But he died. He took the life of another human being. He went over his house. He went on to his property. He's guilty. It's over. And, and maybe he was kind of surprised. Maybe in his mind he thinks he's innocent. Uh, but the jury clearly did not agree with him. Let's take a look at his reaction afterwards. He's, he's emotional. I get it. He's a young guy. He's got a little baby that he's coming to court with. That little baby's going to grow up without a dad. Because he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. I get it. But he took someone's life. We know he took someone's life. Um, his family also reacted today. Like I think they sort of stormed out of the courtroom. I think we have video of the defendant's family. Let's take a look. All right, is that the defendant's family? or the vic There's the defendant's family leaving the courtroom. Um, they may not have expected it, and, and they're going to be broken up about it. I get it. I get it. Um, but at the end of the day, today was about justice for the Ortiz family, Raul Ortiz's family. Um, and I think they finally got it. It took many, many years for them. Um, but you can see it in their eyes. They're not happy. Nobody's happy. They want Raul to be, to be alive. He should be alive. This was all, this was nonsense. This whole case was about nonsense. Never should have happened, but it did. And the system of justice has to step in and do what they do. The jury comes in and makes a decision. They find what, what the facts are, and then they apply the law. And they did it today. Guilty of felony murder, first degree. Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice reporter Julie Janae, who covered this trial from start to finish. Um, a lot of reaction today to this verdict. Uh, what else is happening down there? There was, Vinny. The gallery looked completely different than it has in the first days of this trial. A lot of people were there that we have not seen throughout the course. Of course, anticipating that today would be the day that we'd hear the verdict. They're on the victim side. We saw there was another male family member that joined them. Uh, they have been very calm watching everything that has unfolded in this trial. I've seen some difficulty in watching the pictures that have been put up on the screen, but for the most part, they have really kept their emotions in check. And it was the same during the reading of the verdict. We know they have a victim advocate there who has been translating things for them and the judge also asked them if they wanted the opportunity to give a victim impact statement but they did decline that and then did leave this courtroom but we did speak to the state attorney for this area andrew warren and he commented on what the victim relayed to him about their thoughts on this verdict take a listen I mean, I was able to sit with Raul's family during the trial and talk with them beforehand. It's been six years that they've been waiting to hear those words, guilty, come from the jury. So again, I, I share with them today in having that little bit of closure that they've received. The other, the other thing I'd add, you know, this is a tragedy all around. This could have been avoided. 19-year-old attacking a 58-year-old, throwing his life away over the stupidest thing. This has broken up two families. Uh, Raul's never coming back. Uh, Mr. Robinson now going to prison for the rest of his life over something that really could have been avoided. Just tragic all around. 
And Vinny, also on the defendant side, there were a lot more people today. It was almost an entire community of people who were here to support him, people who were his friends, his family members, those who testified, who were under subpoena and could not actually be in the courtroom with him. But today, because all of the testimony was closed, they were able to be there behind him, including his brothers, uh, his, his Kayla Bryant, the uh, woman who he was dating when this happened, the beginning of all of this. She was there today with her brother as well. And you saw that emotion of them leaving the courtroom, a lot of them crying over what happened. We spoke to the person who, if you've been following this trial closely, you've probably heard about him, but you didn't hear from him. He was the third person who was there with the defendant, Hilario Coronado, nicknamed Fluffy. And he said he thought he was going to testify. He wished he had testified, but he reacted to this verdict and his friend now going away for the rest of his life. The state was depicting my friend as a monster, and he's not a monster. He, if, if you were to know Aaron, you would know that he's the type of person that would do anything for a friend. And the fact that Diaz could stand there and depict him as a monster when he's not, that doesn't sit right with me. Diaz will, in my opinion, say anything to get a conviction. And, I mean, he got it. He convinced the jury that he was some type of monster when he's not. And I just can't believe it. Somebody I grew up my whole life, and he's gone. Now, one other thing that Coronado's told us is that if he had taken the stand, one of the things that he thinks he would have been able to relay that these jurors didn't hear about was a hug that he said he witnessed when he was there between Kimberly Boyette, the star eyewitness for the state, and the defendant. And this is something that has come up in the State Your Ground hearings beforehand. He said that he saw an embrace between them, and he says there's no way that if he was threatening her or scared that he had fatally uh, attacked her friend, that there would have been this embrace, Vinny. Um, I want to get back to Kayla Bryant. Um, you know, viewers have really responded to her and, and, and look at her as being someone here who's, so, you know, she's not responsible for the murder, but she's responsible for kind of set, seemingly setting this whole thing in motion with whatever she said that set off um, her boyfriend at the time. Did she speak at all afterwards today? Did she appear? Uh, how did she look? I mean, on the witness stand, it looked like she felt responsible and was carrying somewhat of a burden regarding all of this from her demeanor. But I don't know her, so I don't know what her baseline uh, demeanor is. But, but a lot of people sort of gathered that from her. Anything from, from her today? Because if she just says nothing about the Circle K, and we watched the video, and she testified that it was really nothing, um, I don't understand it. I don't understand why this happened, Julia. We didn't speak to her directly. She didn't speak to us, but we did speak to her brother. He was there with uh, Hilario Coronado, and he said that, you know, they feel bad about what happened all around uh, for both families, for the Robinson family and for the Ortiz family. He didn't speak specifically about whether his sister feels remorse for what happened in 2014 at the Circle K and how she relayed it. But uh, they did want to defend her, both Coronado and her brother, Cody Bryant, saying that uh, there have been allegations against her in Waimama, Florida, where she lives, uh, that she in some way may have been racially motivated in what she told her boyfriend about Ortiz. And they both denied that that is the case. Coronado, of course, saying that uh, he's of Hispanic background, he's friends with her, trying to vouch for the fact that that was not the case at all. But specifically about how she feels about what she said about the incident, except for what we heard on the stand, that is what we know from Kayla Bryant. Yeah. Now, we saw what she testified to, right? That, yeah, I felt a little uncomfortable. Clearly, that's not what she said six years ago. Because if she's like, oh, yeah, he's, he's sort of close to, you know, he's sort of, that would not have set off anyone, I don't think. And if it did, and if she said it like that and that set him off, uh, uh, this guy may belong behind bars for the rest of his life regardless because he'd be that dangerous. But nothing really happened here. If you even watch the video, Julia, and I don't know if you saw anything differently, but 
when Raul approaches, right, he's there for, you know, seven, ten seconds, whatever it is. As he leaves, I don't see any sort of reaction from her other than a smile, and she grabs her change and leaves. I mean, was there, was there anything that you picked up in that video or anyone else picked up in that video that would make it look like, oh, my goodness, something horrible just happened? You know, we can't hear the conversation. And it was an inappropriate comments that made its way to the criminal affidavit. That's what police wrote down when they were told how this all unfolded, with, that there were sexual comments that were made. So we don't know anything about what was being said, but there was a time when the prosecutor turned up that volume and you can make out that he's saying something to her about buying cigarettes. She's 18. She was there buying cigarettes and uh, things for her mother. And that's what he commented to the cashier. So that indicates to us possibly he was commenting on the fact of what she was purchasing. But we don't know exactly what was said. Even Kayla Bryant said that she doesn't know exactly what was said because it was said to her in Spanish. So it sounds like it was a misunderstanding in the way that it snowballed and added to after she began to tell other people uh, really got out of hand. But at the end of the day, this was about Aaron Robinson's actions against Raul Ortiz when he went to his home. All right. So, um, you know, yesterday there was all the jury drama and, and it was, wasn't like, you know, drama about nothing. It was about jurors talking, seemingly talking about the case before they're supposed to talk about the case and with each other, which was you know, very unusual. The judge, you know, questioned everyone, rehabilitated the, the jury. Uh, but that's obviously issue number one on an appeal. Um, and I don't think anyone's necessarily talking about this today, but I was thinking about it. I mean, is there any concern from Andrew Warren or anyone from the state attorney's office about what happened and how it could potentially impact an appeal in this case? And if so, uh, is there still an open door to any renewed plea negotiations um, where the defendant would waive his right to appeal and perhaps get something less than life? Was there anything like that discussed at court today? I know the verdict just came down, uh, but I was wondering. No word on whether there are plea negotiations. Like you said, it is very early, but we did talk to State Attorney Warren about that specific issue of what he thought about those concerns that were raised yesterday with jurors. Take a listen. We do everything we can to protect the integrity of a prosecution. Judges do a great job here of explaining to the jury the importance of not talking about the case until the case is over for them to deliberate. But occasionally you do have jurors that don't listen to that message and the court has to take some corrective action. It's exactly what the court did. And Vinny, it's worth highlighting that the one count that this jury did not find Mr. Robinson guilty of was that tampering with a witness. And that was one of the issues that came up in the interrogation of the jury yesterday, whether or not they uh, were already talking about the witness and whether they found the eyewitness, Kim Boyette, credible, whether her eyesight was the way that she testified to. So it seems like that may have trickled into their deliberations in her credibility and what they thought about her ultimately. Yeah, so now we prepare for a sentencing, but it, it's automatic, right? It's life without the possibility of parole for first-degree felony murder down in Florida. Right, he was facing at the beginning of this. When he was first arrested and charged with manslaughter, he would have been facing 15 years in prison. Those charges were upped to the first-degree felony murder and that carries a sentence of life in prison without parole. Uh, the lesser included charges that he uh, could have been charged with or been found guilty of rather by this jury were second degree murder, which would have been up to life, but no minimum. So he had those other exp that, that other exposure that was on the table for him. But this jury found for that top count as he's charged, burglary also uh, holds as a up to life sentence when uh, this judge makes the decision on November 23rd. Julia Janae, Court TV crime and justice reporter on the scene, Hillsborough County, Florida tonight, bringing home the verdict for us. Thanks so much, Julia.